So I wanted to look at, at Daniel, partly because Daniel is uh, a very early example of what's sometimes called apocalyptic literature. Um, apocalyptic literature is a literary genre, rather like um, a novel is a literary genre, or a parable is a literary genre. And it's a particular literary genre, so you have to know how to read it. In the same way as you have to know how to read a parable, uh, you don't read a parable as if it were history. You know, so when our Lord said, a certain man had two sons, you don't say, oh really, where did he live? What was his name? What were their names? No, no, that, that's a parable. You see, he's not, he's not saying, it, and, and, his, and his name was Steve. No, no, it, it's not a, so, so you, once, you, once you realize that a, a parable is a particularly literary genre, you know not to take it as if it were history. It's, it's trying to, it's a story, and not a struggle story, trying to make a particular moral point. Um, so, uh, similarly, if you're reading the book of Judith, Judith is what we would today call an historical romance. Uh, it, it's, it, it looks like history. It has a certain amount of uh, um, a very similitude, which is to say historical details that add local historical color, but it's not history. You know, it's not history because when you look at what it's purporting to report historically, it didn't happen. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. so... Said the, it needs to be said probably right up front that for the, for the ancients, the concept of literary genre was not as alive a concept to them as it was to us. For, for us, we, we need to know whether this is uh, history or whether this is historical fiction, uh, whether this is science, might be science fiction, you know? So and we have very set, uh, definite categories. So if we're reading a book on uh, that talks about going to Mars uh, and, and Venus, and they say there's, there's, there's Martians and people on Venus and stuff like that. Uh, we, we, we say, oh, it's science fiction, it's okay. But if it doesn't say science fiction, we're going to throw the book out in disgust and say, idiot author, doesn't he know that there's no Martians? You know, that sort of stuff. So when, you, when you're reading C.S. Lewis's um, science fiction trilogy, uh, uh, um, uh, out, out of the silent planet and Paralandra, or Voyage to Venus, we don't throw it down in disgust when it talks about uh, life on Mars and Venus because we recognize this is the historical a literary genre called science fiction and it's okay. The ancients didn't kind of do that. There was just story. Uh, history and story were kind of synonyms a little bit. Mm. They might have a, a large historical element, like in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, or it might have practically zero historical elements, like the book of Judith, but it was a story that told you something that you needed to know. So that's kind of where the, where the, um, where the, the thing was at. And you know, all this is to say apocalyptic literature it is a particular kind of literary genre. You need to know what you're reading and how to read it, or you'll get very perplexed and you'll write rubbish like, like, like uh, Hal Lindsey wrote in The Late Great Planet Earth. You ever remember the late Planet Earth? That was. Yeah, but I've never read it. Oh, good. That's a good idea. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a, I've never read Mein Kampf. Good. This is a good idea. So, this is the. Um, Hal Lindsey was a very nice guy in the 70s who had not a single clue about probably much of anything. Certainly had, wouldn't recognize uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, literary genre when he read it. So, for him, I think there was, there was, this, there was this, this locust plague that was being described. And he says, ah, this is probably a description of military helicopters because they didn't know what a military helicopter was. No. So, but if you, if you know literary genre, if you know how to read apoc apocalyptic literature, you wouldn't say st a silly stuff like that. So, so Daniel is one of the early species of um, uh, apocalyptic literature. And the interpretation of Daniel is also immensely controversial. Um, which is why, this is the plug, I wrote this book <laughs> um, uh, called A Song in the Furnace, The Message of the Book of Daniel, to try to uh, look at it, the, book, the book of Daniel from a kind of a pious orthodox point of view to say, what's, what's the message? What are we supposed to learn? But also to take what the scholars have said and put it into a digestible form. So, um, and Daniel is one of those um, books that tend to divide the liberals from the conservatives into two warring factions. Kind of like a, a little bit of exegetical mud wrestling, you know? So, so what you have is, in fact, there was a book by um, Josh McDowell. He was the evidence demands a verdict guy. Anyway, um, and so he wrote a book called Daniel and the Critics Den to try to defend the historicity of the stories in Daniel and stuff like that. 
hopeless task if ever there was one, but he gave it his best shot. But the point is, there was Daniel is one of those things whereby the the uh, what he calls the the critics, and I would call the scholars, have said this is when you understand what's what's going on, it is of Maccabean provenance, which I'll explain in in a minute. Uh, it is set back as if it was history written during the Babylonian exile in the Persian time, but it was actually written during the Maccabean times, and to which the the conservatives go twenty five kinds of crazy and say, no, you're a critic, you're you're a destroyer, mm -hmm. you are not a sheep, you're the goat. And this is kind of the, the dividing line, you know. You can't love the Lord because you take a Maccabean date for the book of Daniel. Um, and they used to be one of those guys when, when, when in, the, in the days in college when you have to pick a team, you know, there's only two teams. There's the conservatives and the liberals. And the, the, the liberals basically made me want to puke. So, uh, so that wasn't me. So mm -hmm. the only other team, Jersey, to wear was that of, of the conservatives who were kind of rushing to the barricades to defend the history of Steve Daniel. And the more I read Daniel over the past, well, 50 years now, um, uh, the, I, I've come to the reluctant conclusion that the history of Steve Daniel cannot, cannot be defended. But that's still the word of God. So what do you do with it? Mm. I'm not going to tell you. In fact, I already did tell you. But anyway, but that's it. So, 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 that's what, so that's what's going on. But I need to know that, that the, the book of Daniel is one of those books that uh, attracts a lot of um, uh, controversy around it and, and stuff like this. And so I'm, I was, and I reached the stage where I'm saying to the conservatives and the liberals both, a plague on both your houses. I want you all to shut up and leave the room and leave me alone with the word of God to try to read it with as much sensitivity as I can to understand <clears throat> what God is saying in this thing. And the first thing that, that uh, it, it occurred to me as I was trying to read it with a lot of sensitivity is that there's a tremendous amount of humor in the book of Daniel. There's a, a, what we would today call political satire in there. Mm -hmm. now, satire is one of those things that you either get it or you don't. Mm -hmm. you don't you, it, sometimes you don't it goes right over your head and you don't get it. And especially if your understanding of uh, anything that's scriptural, there can't be any humor into it. Partly because God, I guess, has no sense of humor. <laughs> something like this. So, and if you have it in the sonorous uh, tones of the King James language and the these and the thous, yeah, the humor in the book of Daniel, pol political satire, like it's, like it's in Punch or something like this, mm. seems to be unworthy of the word of God. Um, but there it is anyway. I think if you read it, and, and for example, if you read the book of Jonah, you realize that there's actually a fairly bit of dry Jewish humor in the thing. Mm. Uh, but y if, you, if, you, if you don't, if you say that no, go, go, nothing ever strikes God as funny, uh, and nothing ever strikes the, the prophets as funny, then, then satire becomes one of those forbidden categories in scripture. Um, you would, despite the fact that our Lord uses it all the time, He says, "You know, if you, if you, the guy wants to take a speck out of your eye, and he's got this big log in his own eye." I mean, this is this is a visual joke. You either get it, or or or, or it goes over your head, and you don't. Mm -hmm. So, talk about before we go uh, into Daniel, I wanted to, because I'm suggesting that it is of of um, Maccabean providence, I wanted to talk a little bit about the the time of of, of the Maccabees. The Maccabees were a group of uh, Jewish guerrilla fighters um, that were trying to overthrow uh, and, uh, a Syrian leader called uh, Antiochus IV, or he styled himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means God manifest. Um, and uh, the, there was this <coughs> tremendous uh, fever on the land. There was this sense of degradation. There was a sense of national catastrophe. People were ashamed, people were smarting. They had been promised by the prophets that when they came out of the Babylonian exile, that would be a time of glory. God would restore them. Uh, you read the book of um, Haggai, for example, uh, when, they, when they came out of exile, uh, just a few of them came out of exile. Most of them stayed behind because they had uh, nice, I don't know, falafel shops in Babylon or something like that. I mean, they, they have nice family business there. They're gonna leave. To go what, to a, a ruined land? To do what? For, you know, for, you know farm the bog? Nothing. So, but a, a few brave, enterprising, uh, heroic souls came back, settled around Jerusalem, um, in, the, in, the, in the homelands of Judah. That's why they were called Jews, even though they might have been from all 12 tribes. Mm. Um, even if you say, well, I'm from the tribe of uh, um, uh, Naphtali in the north. 
but I'm living in the land of Judah, so that's why they end up being called Jews. It's a post-exilic title. Anyway, so uh, they were small, um, and they went. The first thing that they needed to do was to rebuild the temple, so they did, with a fair, after a fair bit of nagging from uh, Haggai and, and Zechariah, uh, because right now they were they were trying to get their own uh, families fed, their own fields sown and harvested and stuff like this, and so they were neglecting the temple, and. And Haggai said, you know why you're not having any luck in farming? Because you're ignoring God. You know, if you, if you build a temple, God will, God will bless you. So they built the temple. But the temple that they built compared to Solomon's temple was a pretty poor affair. And it said that when they were building it, some of the people were cheering and some of the people were crying. The ones who were crying were the ones who remembered Solomon's temple, the oldsters. And they said, compared to what we had before, this is it, huh? <laughs> and so, but so, but, um, but Haggai promised them that soon there would be this tremendous uh, international earthquake, as it were, culturally speaking, and all of the Gentiles would come, and God would bring all of the silver and the gold and glorify His house. All of the prophets talked about this. So, uh, Isaiah talked about it, and Jeremiah talked about it, and Ezekiel, and all the guys. That after the exile, there would be a time of restoration. God would bring in. Uh, the king again. God would promise that the house of David would never lack a king to rule over them. Um, uh, and then the, the, the royal family got wiped out in the Babylonian captivity, but it was understood that God, God's promises must be fulfilled. God would bring up and raise up the king again, which is to say the Messiah. And there would be a time of national uh, uh, resurrection. There would be glory. All of the nations would come to the house of the Lord, and Israel would be exalted among, as a chief among all of the nations, and Israel would essentially rule the world in the same way as Rome was about to rule the world. Um, and nothing happened. You're waiting for this, and you're waiting for this, and, you're st and nothing. You're still this little backwater province under the Persians. You're the plaything of the Persians, and then you're the plaything of, 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 the, of the, the Syrians. You recall the history a little bit after uh, Alexander the Great you had the Babylon, and then you had the, the Persians who overthrew Babylon. And is, so when Israel came out of exile, they were under uh, the Persians. Then Alexander the Great roared through there and then and died quickly. And then his, they carved up the empire into uh, four of his generals. Uh, two ended up on top. The, uh, the, uh, the Ptolemies in Egypt on south, king of the south, and the Syrians, the king of the north, and they were kind of fighting it out. And Antiochus, uh, from which a city of Antioch was named, uh, was from Syria. And so now they're the plaything of uh, the Syrians. And then <coughs> Pompey the Great comes in in 63 BC. And now you're the plaything of Rome. So great. So um, so th there, there's all these frustrated expectations. And then when you think it can't get any worse, Antiochus IV comes. Antiochus IV called Antiochus Epiphanes, the, the Jewish uh, punsters call him Antiochus Epimenes, uh, the madman. And so his idea was to say, okay, look, we're going to bring unity. We, I, have a, I have good news to give you. I have this gospel to give you. It's called Hellenism. It's about the glory of the human spirit. It's about the beauty of the human body. It's about you have this wonderful international language. So every, every civilized city had a gymnasium where the young men could exercise. And of course, you did it naked, which is what the word gymnasium means. Uh, gumnos means naked. So, um, and it goes with the splendor of the human body, and the, like I said, the glory of the human spirit and stuff like this. And um, and so, there are a number of uh, uh, Hellenistic Jews in Palestine who said, "Sounds great. We're gonna and 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 so we're we're gonna. The, the, all gods are the same. You know, Zeus, Yahweh, whatever. It's the same. The, the most high heavenly god. It's, it's the same thing." And, you know, food laws, you know. Food laws were meant to keep us separate from the Gentiles. Who wants to be separate when we can join the party, when we can join the winners, join the victors, and, and, and embrace this, this glorification of the human spirit? Of course, it means that you just got to somehow get rid of your marks of circumcision. How they did that, I neither know nor want to know. <laughs> but at any rate, but that would, because, so, uh, and they would uh, use the, um, Greek fashions, you know, uh, dress like the dress like the Greeks and stuff like this, um, and so, and Antiochus got a little bit impatient and said, "You're all going to embrace this whether you like it or not." And so, I, I, I'm going to, to the, the resistors who were saying, "No, no, 
forsake the Torah. We cannot forsake the God of our fathers. We cannot forsake the law that the God of our fathers. Circumcision is, is, is the sign of the covenant. We are meant to be his people. We're meant to be the chosen people. We're meant to be different than, than the nations. How can we abandon the ways of our fathers? So Antiochus said, you can, I'll, I'll show you how you abandon the ways of the fathers. And so he said he was, there was this essentially this religious persecution. Copies of the Torah were burnt. Mm-hmm. People were forced to, eat, uh, to violate the food laws by eating pork. Uh, they forced them to uh, offer sacrifice to the pagan gods because uh, the, 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 uh, the sow was sacred to Zeus, so he offered a sow on the altar on the, in the temple, thereby defiling it, setting up what was called the abomination of desolation. And so they had this, this national, uh, Israel felt, I mean, they were occupied, they were occupied by the Persians and now the, the Syrians and later on by the Romans. But this was, I mean, nobody else before who had conquered them said, you can't practice your religion. If you don't have the temple, I guess good luck with that. Mm-hmm. But, but they, they had no problem with them practicing their religion. The Babylonians didn't mind. The Babylonians didn't force them to worship Marduk. The Persians never didn't force them to worship the gods of the Persians. The Romans didn't say, you're going to worship Jupiter. If you, if, you, if you want to do your own idiotic Jewish thing, knock yourself out. But Antiochus did. So this was like this collective uh, trauma <coughs> for, the Jewish, for the Jewish psyche. And, and so, <coughs> of course, provoked uh, a resistance movement, essentially a guerrilla movement of, of the so-called Maccabees, uh, the, the Judas Maccabees, Judas the Hammer, who rebelled and they overthrew the rule of Antiochus and set up uh, the Hasmonean rulers, the ones who were uh, 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 the uh, independent rulers of Judea. So and so now we are we have uh, we are an independent state. And they thought this is going to be better. We're not under the uh, we're not under the Gentiles. They very quickly discovered, no, nah, people are people, and the, the Hasmonean rulers are been as brutal and corrupt as anybody else. Ouch! But but at the beginning, this was the, uh, the the you have to kind of think back of how how traumatic it was to see God has abandoned us. Not only has He not brought in this glory that He promised through the prophets. Now this Antiochus Epiphanes, we 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 can't even. We, we can't even circumcise our children. He's changing the law. He's outlawing the Torah. He's doing all of this stuff. And, and God said that, that we'd be under him. So we need encouragement. And the encouragement is the book of Daniel. I would suggest that the encouragement is, is a tract for the times to saying, do not abandon your faith. That's, that's the message of the book of Daniel. The message of the book of Daniel is God will be faithful to his promises somehow, some way, Sometime, do not abandon your faith. Do not knuckle under to uh, Antiochus, because in every generation, there's a, the Antiochus Epiphanes is. The, uh, I would suggest when when you have a totalitarian system, Hitler, Stalin, whatever, the, it, it, it's almost like he is stirring in his long sleep, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, in, to a greater or lesser degree, uh, whatever the, the government says, you may not practice your religion. That's what we need to hear, the book, the message of, of the book of Daniel. So I wanted to begin by uh, reading a chapter from the first book of Maccabees to kind of get into a time machine as much as we can to try to get back into those, into those days. First Maccabees, chapter one. Quick question, when would Maccabees about have been written? Um, that's it. Let me, let me check my notes. I'm, this, this is suggesting it about 100 BC in Palestine. Because it, uh, as I was, you know, read through the, the Old Testament for the second yeah. time, as soon as I got to Maccabees, it seemed much more modern yeah. than the rest of it. Yeah. Like, it was just a really strong feeling yeah. of more modern, almost like something that's yeah. a lot closer to our own Well, it is, in, 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 in the sense that... the way the stories are told. Yeah, and, and, and the sense <laughs> that... Um, uh, it, um, when you're into Hellenism, it's already <coughs> starting to push into the modern world a little right. bit, a, a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so you figure if Maccabees was about 100 BC, and of course it comes without comes without publishing information, so you got to. Yeah. You know, but uh, that's 300 years after Malachi. Yeah. I mean that's a long time. Mm-hmm. So, so it tries to give you a sense of uh, the desecration that was going on in, in Israel. Let me just read you chapter one, and then we'll uh, uh, leap into the Book of Daniel a, a little bit. After Alexander. That's Alexander the Great. 
the, the son of Philip the Macedonian, who came from the land of Kittim, had defeated Darius, the king of the Persians, and the Medes, he succeeded him as king. He had previously become king of Greece. He fought many battles, conquered strongholds, and put to death the kings of the earth. He advanced to the ends of the earth and plundered many nations. When the earth became quiet before him, he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. He gathered a great, a very strong army and ruled over countries, nations, princes, and they, be they became tributary to him. After this, he fell sick and perceived that he was dying. So he summoned his most honored officers who had been brought up with him from, the, from youth and divided his kingdom among them while he was still alive. And after Alexander had reigned 12 years, he died. That's in about 323 BC. Then his officers began to rule, each in his own place. They all put on crowns after his death, and so did their sons after them for many years, and they caused many evils on the earth. And from them came forth a sinful root, Antiochus Epiphanes, the son of Antiochus the king, and he had been a hostage in Rome. He began in the 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. That's in about 175 BC. In those days, lawless men came forth from Israel. These are the Hellenistic Jews, and misled many and said, let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles round about us, for since we separated from them, many evils have come upon us. Th this, this proposal pleased them, and some of the people eagerly went, uh, went to the king. He authorized them to observe the ordinance of, of the Gentiles, so they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to Gentile custom and removed the marks of circumcision and abandoned the Holy Covenant. They joined with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. When Antiochus saw that his kingdom was established, he was determined to become king in the land of, of the land of Egypt, that he might reign over both kingdoms, which is say Syria in the north and Egypt in the south. So he invaded Egypt with a strong force, with chariots and elephants and cavalry with a large fleet. He engaged Ptolemy, king of Egypt, in battle, and Ptolemy turned and fled before him, and many were wounded and fell. And they captured the fortified cities in the land of Egypt and plundered the land of Egypt. After subduing Egypt, Antiochus returned in the 143rd year, that's 169 BC. He went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. He arrogantly entered the sanctuary and took the golden altar, the, the lampstand for the light and all its utensils. He also took the table for the bread of the presence, cups for drink offerings, the bowls, the golden censers, the curtain, the crowns, the gold decoration on the front of the temple. He stripped it all off. He took the silver uh, and gold, the costly vessels. He also took the hidden treasures which he found. Taking them all, he departed to his own land. He committed deeds of murder. He spoke with great arrogance. Israel mourned deeply in every community. Rulers and elders groaned. Maidens and young men became faint. The beauty of the women faded. Every bridegroom took up the lament. She who sat in the bridal chamber was mourning. Even the land shook for its inheritance, and all the house of Jacob was clothed with shame. So you gotta, I mean, for us, it's they it lost all of this stuff. I mean, this wasn't just um, um, an act of theft. This was an act of sacrilege. It's, it is, if you take the stuff of the temple, you are essentially challenging that, the God of the temple and giving him the finger. What are you gonna do about it? I mean, this is kind of, this was the, the uh, it's a, 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 a visceral sort of reaction from Israel. Two years later, the king sent to the cities of Judah a, Chief tax collector of, of uh, uh, sorry, a chief collector of tribute, and he came to Jerusalem with a large force. Deceitfully, he spoke peaceable words to them, and they believed him. But he suddenly fell upon the city and dealt it a severe blow and destroyed many of the people of Israel. He plundered the city, burned it with fire, and tore down its houses and its surrounding walls. And they took captives, the women, the children, and seized the cattle. And they fortified the city of David with a strong wall and strong towers, and it became a citadel. They stationed there sinful people, lawless men. They strengthened their position. They stored up arms and food and collected the spoils of Jerusalem. They stored them there and it became a great snare. It became an ambush against the sanctuary, an evil adversary of, the, of Israel continually. On every side of the sanctuary, they shed innocent blood. They even defiled the sanctuary. Because of them, the residents of Jerusalem fled. She became a dwelling of strangers. She became strange to her offspring and her children forsook her. Her sanctuary became desolate as a desert. Her feasts were turned into mourning, her Sabbaths into her approach, her honor into contempt. Her dishonor now grew as great as her glory. Her exaltation was turned into mourning. Then the king wrote to the whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should give up his customs. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many even of Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. 
king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and feasts, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and, sa and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, to leave their sons uncircumcised. Then they were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane, so they should forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. In such words he wrote to the whole kingdom, and he appointed inspectors over all the people and commanded the cities of Judah to offer sacrifice city by city. Many of the people, everyone who, for, who forsook the law, joined them, and they did evil in the land. They drove Israel into hiding in every place and refuge of the land. Now in the fifteenth day of Kislev, in the 145th year, that's 167 BC, they erected a desolating sacrilege on the altar of burnt offering. That's the so-called abomination of desolation. They also built altars to the surrounding cities of Judah and burned incense at the doors of the houses and the streets. The books of the law which they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Where the covenant, where the book of the covenant was found in possession of anyone, or if anyone adhered to the law, the decree of the king condemned them to death. They kept using violence against Israel, against those found month after month in the cities. <clears throat> on the 25th day of the month, they offered the sacrifice of the altar, which was upon the altar burnt offering. According to the decree, they put to death the women who had their children circumcised. In their families and those who circumcised them, they hung the infants from their mothers' necks. But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to profane the Holy Covenant. And they did die, and very great wrath came upon Israel. Then chapter 2 talks about the rebellion of the Maccabees. Mm -hmm. I read this thing to you because you, you have to get, get a sense of this was new. Like, like I said, look, the, the, all of the other conquerors, as, as long as you paid your taxes and paid, the, and paid the tribute, they could care less what you did. Circumcise your kids. Don't circumcise your kids. Don't eat pork if you don't eat pork. They don't care. Just fork over the, fork over the taxes. This was something new. This was, I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how, how do you handle this? Where do you hide? Mm -hmm. And so the... The the image that we have in in here is of this monstrous tyrant who is persecuting people, setting himself up as God, and Antiochus Epiphanes as God manifest, and changing the Torah, changing the times, and commanding that people not follow their religion. So, not surprisingly, when you get a look in the, the book of Daniel, starting with uh, chapter one, they're all stories about a tremendous tyrant who forbids Israel to practice their religion and forces them to worship idols. Mm -hmm. That's what all the stories are about. So I would suggest, in, instead of saying, oh, what a coincidence, that happened, that happened in the Babylonian captivity, and uh, just like it was gonna later happen. I thought, no, it's not a coincidence. It's, 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 it, 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 the, the stories reveal, I would suggest, their, their Maccabean providence. Those stories are deliberate. They were written after the outrages of Antiochus Epiphanes to say, this is what happened. Our forefathers were experienced that and they held firm and God vindicated them. You hold firm too and God will vindicate you as well. I mean, that's the lesson. And it talks about, and so you have a series of, series of <coughs> visions starting with chapter two. There's another one in chapter seven and chapter eight and, and chapter nine and then chapters 10 to 11. And all of these stories talk about there will be kingdom succeeding kingdom succeeding kingdom. There's there, whether they're, the, the four different metals in, in, this, in the, um, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw, or whether they're uh, the four beasts that Daniel saw in, in his vision in, 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 chapters, uh, in chapter seven, or, or, or whatever. But they, have, they, uh, they start with Babylon, what a surprise, and that they end with this person who is persecuting Israel and changing the times and the law, and then that guy is overthrown and the kingdom of God comes in. That's, that's, that's the, the sequence of events. It's in chapter two, that's in chapter seven, that's in chapter eight, and all, all, the, all the way through. And I think they, I would suggest that the, it starts with Babylon, nobody disagrees about that, but what's the final kingdom? What's the fourth beast? What's the fourth kingdom that persecutes them? That it's hard to resist the conclusion that it's Antiochus Epiphanes. All of the scholars, will say, for example, will say, that the, the vision in chapter eight, which we'll get to eventually, there's a guy, the, the bad guy there is called the, the little horn. Everybody agrees that's Antiochus Epiphanes. In chapter seven, there is the bad guy who's called the little horn. I would suggest it's the same guy. 
that you're, the, all of the all of, all the divisions are consistent. They repeat the story, but with increased uh, and increasingly horrifying detail. So, the, so by the time you get to the, the final the final vision, in, uh, narrated in chapters ten to twelve, uh, the detail is really really precise because they're current events. The, the, the some of the stories get get. The, the early history of, of Babylon gets some of the historical details wrong because somebody is writing about ancient history that he doesn't know about. But the reason it's so detailed and accurate by the time you get to the time of the Maccabees because it's, it's not history, it's current events. Mm -hmm. Of course, to know what's happening. Anyway, this is what I'm, I, I tip my hand, and this is what I'm, I'm about to say. Um, the, the problem with the, a more fundamentalist or conservative or traditional reading, depending upon what, uh, how you want to describe it, is that you got to say each of the visions is talking about something different. Chapter 8 is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, but chapter 7 is talking about the end of the world. You know, and so why would you, uh, and so they're all talking about different different things. We'll uh, look at that a little bit more closely when, when, when we get there. Um, but as it, what's, what's common to chapter 7 and chapter 8 in chapter nine is they, the sacrifices in the temple are stopped. There are changes made in the Torah and the law, and this is considered a catastrophe. It's considered a catastrophe when the sacrifice in the temple is stopped in chapter eight. So you consider that when, when it talks about the, the, the sacrifice being made to cease in chapter nine, it's considered to be a catastrophe, not salvation. Mm -hmm. The conservative thing says, oh, this is talking about Jesus. Uh, stopping the sacrifices in the, in, the, in the temple when he died on the cross. There's a couple of things to be said about that that I will say later, like, later on. But one is that when he died on the cross, the sacrifices in the temple did not in fact cease. And they, they kept on until the, until the Romans basically burned the temple to the ground. Um, making, them, making them superfluous and making them cease are not the same thing. The other thing is that if you're made to understand in chapter 8 that this, 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 this cessation of sacrifice is sacrilege, blasphemy, and catastrophe in chapter 8, why would it be anything different in chapter 9? It's the same thing. So anyway, so um, I would suggest that that is uh, the, his the historical providence of the book of Daniel and, in, and uh, um, the, the shadow of those traumatic days the shadow of Antiochus Epiphanes casts itself all over the book of Daniel. And like I said, the, the message is do not compromise with the world. Do not knuckle under. Do not abandon your faith because it's, it seems to be the only sensible thing politically and culturally to do. You know, God will fulfill his promises. God will come through. Okay, so chapter, chapter one in the book of Daniel. Um, it, it begins with uh, the, uh, going into the Babylonian captivity. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, that is to say Babylon, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the sanctuary of his God. And the king ordered Ashpenaz, which I think I, I suggest to you is not a name, but a, a common noun. And it means essentially innkeeper, or as we, or as we would say, sacristan. Anyway, uh, um, uh, the, the Ashpenaz, the chief of the officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal families and of the nobles, youths in, his whom, in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, with the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the, of the Chaldeans, that is to say, the Babylonian sages. And the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were entered into the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The king, they, then the commander of the, of the official, uh, gave them, uh, assigned names to them. To Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hadaniah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Mishach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Um, so, just back up a little bit. Um, the, uh, the, um, 
what, what you probably remember the history of Israel, but I'll tell you again just in case you forget a little bit. Um, the Israel decided that they were going to defy Babylon, the superpower of the day. And people, uh, prophets like Jeremiah said, don't do that, that's dumb. God is sending the Babylonians as a scourge for your sins because you're, you're, up, you're up to your eyeballs in idolatry and social injustice. And unless you repent, you're all you're toast. God, mm -hmm. God is sending Babylon to resist the scourge of Babylon is to resist the judgment of God. You don't, you don't want to do that. So there were people, they were, they were divided, to, but most of the people were uh, uh, um, uh, all whooped up and to say, no, Israel, God will defend us. That's sort of that. We have the temple, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh. It's a quote from Jeremiah. God would never let his temple be sacked. Uh -huh. So, um, but he did. And so the, the Babylonians came in in, in 597, <coughs> and uh, that's the, the third year of uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and took away a bunch of the, the people from the, into the land of Babylon to serve them. And uh, the the nationalists said they were raff, they were riffraff anyway. They were rabble. Who, who we're not going to miss them. Who needs them? And so you know, fight on uh, and don't repent. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel said they're not coming back. They would say no. They will come back and they will bring all of the, all of the vessels of the Lord with them. And he said they're not coming back. This is only the beginning. So they. Uh, did not repent, and of course, it was it was only the beginning. The the Nebuchadnezzar came back instead of just taking a few of them out into into uh, Babylon and setting up a puppet ruler, which he did, um, uh, Zedekiah. Um, he came in and said, "Okay, enough of the, enough of this rebellion. I've taken every, every, everything comes down now." So he laid siege to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and the the walls were breached, and you know this. You know the sad story. Uh, the the king's son, the king and his sons, tried to tried to flee. Um, they caught the king's sons, gouged out their eyes in front of the king, and put them put them to death. And then the temple burned to the ground, and the long exile begins. This is about 586 BC. So, and the taking of the vessels of the temple of the Lord. This was the beginning of the sacrilege. It shows the power of the king of Babylon. And you will recall from First Maccabees uh, the idea of taking away the vessels. If you are, if this just happened to you in the in the news three weeks ago about Antiochus taking those vessels, you're going to say, "Huh, déjà vu or what?" So, but so, but what what they were <coughs> what they would do is, is in this exchange of populations, they would take. Well, they would they would leave the beggars and stuff in the land, farm your idiot plot. But they would take the cream of the crop they would take there. And if you were a good looking kid, and you would you'd be trained for what what we would today call the civil service. But you gotta make sure that the kids can get educated and they'd learn they can they can speak from uh, the language of the court and know how to serve the king and all of that all all of that sort of stuff. So you had uh, three years of this. So, um, including eating the king's food, and once again, you, you'll recall that Antiochus, it was it, it, this, a lot of the program of Antiochus revolved around food. You're not going to, we're forced you to eat defiled food. We're forced you to abandon your food laws. This isn't abandoning the food laws, uh, presumably, but it's about food. So it, it's hard not to see this as an echo of what was happening in the times of the Maccabees. Um, so, in verse 8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. And so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Um, you got to ask yourself, what's defiling about pagan food? It didn't say that it was a, a violation of the food laws. It didn't say that it was eating pork. It just said it was rich food. So you're wondering, what, what's, 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 the, what's Daniel's problem? Well, because I guess it's Gentile food and it's rich, and I am an ascetic-minded Jew or something like this. It doesn't doesn't say, but but again, this is the the point isn't the historicity of the thing or even the credibility of the thing. The point was we were we were forced to defile ourselves by uh, violating the food laws by Antiochus Epiphanes. Here's a story about someone refusing to eat food as well. Not because it was a violation of the food laws, but because it was too rich and sumptuous and they didn't want to do it. 
But there you go. So God granted Daniel favor. Literally, uh, it's it's uh, it's where Chesed, uh, uh, loving kindness, mercy, compassion. In the sight of the commander of the, of the officials, the commander of the officials said to Daniel, "I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? That would make me forfeit my head to the king, literally make my head guilty." But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the, of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, "Please test your servants for ten days, which is to say for a short little period of time, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink." Then let our appearance be observed in your presence, in the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold the choice food and the wine that they were to drink, and kept on giving them vegetables. As for these youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom, and Daniel understood all kinds of visions and dreams. At the end of the days, that's three years, which the king had, had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of all of them there was not one found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and, and, and conjurers who were in his, in his realm. And Daniel continued throughout the Babylonian reign, which is to say until the first uh, year of Cyrus the king. So that's that's the story. And the, the story is about someone saying, I'm, it's, I'm not going to eat uh, food given to me by pagans, like we said, as they say, which has this resonance with the Antigas thing. And God, it said that the line that's supposed to jump out at you is, God granted Daniel favor and compassion. This was a rescue from God. It wasn't just, did say, the king was an, the king's official was a nice guy. No, no, the, the, the rescue didn't come from the king's official. The rescue came from God. So the moral of the story is, if you hold to your integrity about food, God will rescue you. And the rescue consisted of not, not being forced to eat the food, and that when you finally came to the king within 10 days, you could see that you're, you're looking healthier than everybody else. You want to, uh, the medical people among us will say, are you sure 10 days on, on, on vegetables and water can make that much of a difference? And the answer is, well, not, not likely. But there's, it's the first, it, it's meant to be a miracle. It's not meant to be, you know, this is a, uh, all of you dietitians take note. You know, this is you know, the, the, the Daniel diet or something like that. It's made it. that, 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 that. That ain't it. It's meant to be, it starts off uh, with a kind of low temperature, but is there was, uh, there was a pressure to conform to pagan ways. You say, nope, I'm not going to conform to pagan ways. God rescues you and does a miracle. It's, it's kind of a small little thing. It's a small little like uh, uh, um, requirement of conformity, you know, just eating food. You're not asking you to, you know, sacrifice to idols. That'll come later. But it, but it's a small little thing. It's a small little rescue. You don't have to eat the food. It's a small little miracle. Ten days later, you're healthier than all those other guys. It's going to get it get it's get ramp, gets ramped up very 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 quickly. But I mean, but that's the that's the first lesson that it's kind of pushing across the table very kind of gently. In, in chapter two, it's gonna get pushed across the table uh, spectacularly uh, more. Um, um, and in chapter three, even more so. Worship the idol or you get cast into the fiery furnace and God does not a little miracle, God does a big, a big fat miracle. I'm sending the angel into there so that the fire doesn't burn you or even the, the, the smell of fires upon you. But, but that's the pattern. The demand for conformity the defiant refusal, uh, the rescue, and in many places, the king acknowledges the God of the Hebrews is the true God, and we must all worship him. Of course, he forgets that in about an hour and a half, so in just in time for the next persecution. Your, your clue that, you know, like, like for example, in chapter two, I don't want to start chapter two because I want to spend a lot of time on it, but in chapter two, um, the king's about to throw all of the guys uh, kill them all unless they can do something unreasonable like tell them not just what your dream means but what your dream was mm -hmm. and when they said well how can I tell you 
what it means, they'll say, unless you first tell me what it was. If you don't tell me, I'll kill you all. And so the, the, the decree goes out to kill all, essentially all of the civil service. It's your first clue that you're not dealing with, with history, but at any rate, but whatever. Um, and so that's going to be, uh, that's, going, that's going to be Daniel. And so um, uh, the, uh, in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse, verse 25, when Daniel says, no, it's okay, we're, we're not going to die. I'll tell the king what it means. And so, okay. So, Arioch, this guy, hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and said, I have found a man among the exiles of Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. I thought, he's introducing a new character. You just told me, you just told me that, that Nebuchadnezzar found Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah into the king's service, found them ten times better than anybody else. Never thought to ask him. And when you said this, you know, I'd like to, I, your, your Majesty, I'd like to present to you Daniel, whom you've never met before, even though you've, you've, he's been serving you all this time and you find him ten times better than anybody else. Again, but the, the, there's historical problems with, with the narrative because it's not history. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is unkind and unfair to demand uh, historical precision or even historical con con consistency from something that's essentially not history but uh, a story because you get this over and over again. Nebuchadnezzar is a five-star idiot throughout all of this, you know. Um, uh, even in chapter three, when they're gonna cast uh, Ananiah, Ezra, and, and Mishael into the fire, where's Daniel? Is Daniel in this chapter? No, what happened to him? Mm -hmm. They're all supposed to, you know. But again, you say, is that sensible when he was on vacation? Taking a sabbatical in Persia. I mean, no, but but that ain't the point. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're going to try to make it historically sound, you got problems. But the answer is, don't just listen to what the text says. Don't try to force it, uh, as I used to do. Tr don't try to force it into an historical mold, which will make it make sense. Later on, we'll see in in chapter six, because all the, the king has to keep making these unreasonable demands. Um, because the because pagan kings are stupid, they make unreasonable demands. The subtext is, pagan kings are morons. They're they're not fit to rule. They're all idiots. That's why they're saying you got to tell me what my dream means, and I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. That's unreasonable. Yeah, that's the point. You know, or the king or the king says you got to um, you can't pray to for all for all this time. Uh, there is Cyrus, an, an, another king, but a pagan king, so he's an idiot. He says you can't make any prayer to anybody except me. I thought to myself. How does that work in the, in the pagan world? Can you imagine a pagan saying, we're gonna suspend the worship of the gods. You're just gonna to pray to me. And the gods aren't gonna say, got an earthquake or two in line for you, baby doll. I mean, this is the, no, nobody, nobody does this. All of the pagans understood that you offered sacrifice to the gods so that they wouldn't get angry with you, that they would ensure stability and prosperity in your land. So this is not, so why, why, would you, why would you do that? It shows you that Cyrus is an idiot. Cyrus is unreasonable. Um, and, and when you see how he's kind of badgered by his staff, uh, Cyrus is a, is a bit of a putz, you know? And so that's the, that, that's the, that's the, that's the point. Um, and, and again, you, to try, it's uh, some uh, you know, desperate commentators try to do it. They try to say, well, Maybe he wasn't saying, don't pray to anybody except me. Maybe he just meant that he would have some sort of a role in the priesthood. First of all, that's not what the text says. And this is, this is an act of exegetical desperation. You, you miss the point of that it, this is the political satire of saying, can you, can you see now how stupid these Gentiles are? How can you take them seriously? How can you take Antiochus Epiphany seriously? How can you take come to that later on Caesar seriously? You know, that's the point. Um, you see it in an even bigger way when you look at the additions to the Book of Daniel, so-called. Uh, there's uh, some additions to the Book of Daniel that weren't the original part of Daniel. They disturb the uh, uh, the the brilliant structure of the book. This is structured precisely, brilliantly. I mean, this is a, this is a masterpiece. And when you stick on the story of Susanna at the front, or Bell and the dragon at the end, it, it destroys the symmetry of the thing. Uh, it, it's, it's a different tone. 
um, it, it lacks um, the brilliant storytelling of this thing. It, it lacks the drama. Um, so, uh, but it, it makes the kings even stupider. You know, I mean, the, but but that's the so when you read the story of Bell and the Dragon, which I, which we can read just to, you know, you can, you can say what kind of an idiot is the king? Can anybody be that stupid and actually rule? Yeah, no, but but that's the point. You're, you're reading political satire. Um, so uh, when you this is this this is political satire too. The editions of the Book of Daniel were even a broader. Uh, Grosser, less refined kind of uh, of political satire, you know. It's 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 almost coming to name calling a little bit. Mm. Wait, it's okay, but but that's it's uh, it is a polemical work. This was this is a I would suggest Daniel canonical Daniel had a little bit of polemics in it, but it's it's mostly an underground tract. Now, not so much saying that that paganism is wrong. They take it for granted that to say that Jews can't keep the Torah is wrong. You know, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to make that point. Their, their point, you, for all of us who know that what's happening to us is a catastrophe and we must not knuckle under, they said, this is, God will, God will repay you for not knuckling under. But there's no polemic against the pagans because you know, they, don't, they, don't, they don't need polemic. They need to bring steel and defiance and courage into the hearts of the Jews. Whereas in in the other, in the additions to the book of Daniel and other th and other things like that, you 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 do have some polemic in there. So anyway, any any uh, any questions? It's, it's the, we don't have to rush away after after one hour, but I'm, I'm reluctant to jump into chapter two because that's an hour for sure. Could you remind us of the timeline of when Daniel's written, and uh, then? Maccabees yeah. is written and I'm just curious because you briefly mentioned Daniel's written kind of looking back in time of the Babylonian captivity and then also kind of being written in some time in the present yeah. of the um, Maccabees yeah. um, it, it seems as if in the absence of adequate uh, and accurate publication information which no book had back then um, sometimes, like in the book of Sirach, you can date it pretty good because he actually says in this date, so that's good. Most stuff didn't, didn't have that. <clears throat> but the events that it's narrating had to have happened. So, you have, uh, so, we, can, so we can probably date Maccabees from about, to about 100 BC or so. The outrages of, of, of Antiochus took place in the 160s BC, so 60 years later or so, then they start to write up the story of the heroes. Um, so the date of Daniel, if I may read from this thing, um, I've, I've suggested in this commentary that the book of Daniel is not an historical record and a collection of predictions dating from the 6th century BC, but rather a pseudepigraphal apocalypse dating from the 2nd century BC, possibly incorporating material from an earlier time. A number of factors push one to this conclusion. First of all, we find the historical material contained in the story set in Babylon do not match history, as we mentioned in the footnotes of this book. Such a view of, of history as we find there makes no sense if written by a contemporary witness of the events of the sixth century, but might be expected of someone writing in the second century, for to that person the events would be long past, and many of the common people in Palestine would have only a vague historical grasp of the ancient events. The common man did not have access to his historical records as we do today, and such confusions would not be unusual. Attempts to salvage the historicity of the, of the adventure stories had not been successful, though its defenders have valiantly offered a variety of mutually incompatible solutions. Darius the Mede, for example, has been identified with the defenders of the historicity with people as various as Cambyses, Ugbaru, Cyrus's governor, Astyrgis, uh, and even Cyrus the Persian himself. Such a variety of witnesses to an element of desperation on the part of the defenders and the impossibility of the attempt. Added to this seemingly cloudy view and uncertain grip of the 6th century history is a completely accurate and finely detailed view of the 2nd century. It is the combination of an unclear view of the Babylonian times with an apparent intimate acquaintance of with, um, with the Hellenistic times that leads one to conclude that the writer was in fact living in those Hellenistic times. Otherwise, how would one explain a 6th century writer's uncertain grip on his own times and his apparent obsession with the Hellenistic period? 
It is, of course, possible that a prescient 6th century prophet would focus on such detail of Antiochus Epiphanes, the exclusion of everything else, including the destruction of the temple by Rome in 70 AD, but such a narrow concern needs explaining. Um, why not? Uh, we also know the, voc the, voc the vocabulary of the book. It may or may not be true that the Aramaic used as, is compatible with that of the 6th century, but it appears that the Hebrew used is more in common with the post-exilic Hebrew of Ezra and afterward than it does with late uh, with the late biblical Hebrew, such as was used in the exile. Mm. Add to this the presence of Greek words, such as those defined, describing the musical instruments in chapter 2, which date from the Hellenistic periods, and the impression of a Hellenistic date for the book is strengthened. Additionally, the, book of, the Hebrew canon for the book of Daniel is, list, is not listed among the prophets, but among the writings. This may indicate a late date, since it was considered by Jews that the period of prophecy ceased with the prophet Malachi in about 400 BC. Also, we cannot find Daniel listed among the prophets in the long description in praise of famous biblical men in Sirach 44 to 50. The role of Hebrew heroes follows a roughly chronological path, so that if Daniel were known to be the great prophet in Seir of exile, one would expect him to be described after Ezekiel and before, um, before Zerubbabel in uh, Sirach 49. But in fact, Daniel never shows up anywhere at all. This may indicate a date for the book of Daniel after the book of Sirach was written. At the very least, the omission needs some explanation if the book of Daniel was written in the 6th century known in Israel afterwards. Um, none of the many and varied arguments for the late date of Daniel is conclusive in itself, but when taken together, the cumulative effect is overwhelming. The defenders of an early date are driven to their positions not so much by objective evidence, but by their prior ideological commitment to the historicity of the book of Daniel. For them, Daniel claims to be historically accurate and claims to be the predictive, uh, claims to be uh, um, a predictive prophecy. And since it is part of the canonical word of God, it must be historically accurate and genuine prophecy, all the evidence to the contrary notwithstanding. So talk a little bit about the literary genre. The other thing is that in chapter 11, um, it narrates quite accurately the career of Antiochus Epiphanes. And then um, in, in, um, when it comes to the end, uh, in verse 40, it said, at the time of the end, the king of the south will collide with him and the king of the north, uh, that's um, the, the king of Syria, will come against him with chariots. Um, and it narrates the final career of Antiochus Epiphanes and how and where he died, inaccurately. So most of the scholars would say that it's quite accurate and immensely detailed right up to, mm -hmm. to verse 40 because it's narrating history. And now they're predicting his end and the, the, or what we might say guessing and the guesses were wrong. Mm -hmm. So you can you have people like uh, St. Jerome who said it's talking about Antiochus of Iphides right up to there and now with the first 40 it's talking about the Antichrist of the end times by, by, by anybody's figuring 2100 years later. Uh, first of all, why did you talk about how Antiochus Epiphanes died? If you wanted to say Antiochus Epiphanes died, oh, and then 2,000 years or more later, here's what's going to happen to the Antichrist. I can do that, but you, but it, if you're just reading, it, he's talking about the, 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 the king of the north, the king of the north, the king of the north. That's Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of the north, who's now no longer Antiochus Epiphanes. Now he's the Antichrist more than 2,000 years later. Really? You, you would ever again this is I, I would suggest a an a sincere and impassioned attempt to avoid the obvious you can't say that it's wrong because it's the bible but if you're again if you're it depends what what are you reading you're, a, you're essentially reading an underground tract and that the point isn't when Antiochus Epiphanes is, is going to die the point is God will redeem us strengthen your hands God will not fail us he will take him out sooner or later and save us. Uh, it also says, at that time, the resurrection will happen. So that's why you've got to push it to the end. Uh, but again, this is you can only do this by essentially running roughshod over the, over the in entirety of, of the verses. That's not what it says. So my, because I believe this to be the word of God, I take seriously what it says. If it's, if it's an embarrassment to my conservative ideology, my conservative ideology can bite me. I have to believe what the Word of God says uh, and prefer what the text actually says as the Word of God to the presuppositions of my conservative ideology. My conscience is held fast to the Word of God. If, if I, 
That doesn't make me a, a liberal. That makes me faithful to what the text actually says. So you have to figure out, given the fact that the text actually says this, how do you interpret it? What's the message? What's the takeaway? That's why I wrote the book, to try to say it's not a mistake, it's a message. So anyway, that's the... That's interesting that you say that, because maybe the conservative individual that is want it, doesn't want the yeah. that prophecy to be untrue, they might say something similar. Well, and there was one uh, recent, recent um, uh, very good conservative commentary. He says, well, it, it, it's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, because clearly you can't, the Antichrist, please. But it, it's describing it in this general kind of stylized term. That, that didn't happen, but, but that, 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 that's okay. It's describing it in generalized, generalist, uh, generalized and generalistic terms, even though it's, you know, the, the details don't matter. The, the, it's describing, you know, you know how they say, you can say, oh, live happily ever after. He lived, did not live happily ever after. And that's what it's trying to say. Okay, but, but again, in my view, it smacks of, it smacks of, of desperation. Mm -hmm. If you're just taking the text seriously, it doesn't look like uh, a generalized, and he kept on going and God smacked him down. What do you think the motivation of trying to shoehorn these other things into it. What well, kind of presuppositions is well, the one taking? They're good. I, I, I share a lot of the presuppositions. They're, they're saying that it's the word of God. Yep. It has to be true. Yep. I agree with all that. What do you mean by true? Mm. Does true mean historically true? Is is it possible that you can use the the, the uh, literary structure of, of uh, a predictive prophecy to try to make a political point and a theological political point. Can you do that or can you not do that? But if you say you can't do it, okay, but that's not something that you get from the text. That's a presupposition and an assertion that you're bringing to the text. Mm. And it's one that, by the way, ends up doing violence to the text. Almost like that's why Romeo I, and Juliet kind of situation. Or... Yeah, I mean, if you're, I mean, it, it's the same, for example, to be spectacularly controversial, um, uh, Jonah. When, did they ever talk to you about Jonah in this thing? Like, so I'm not no. repeating myself if I didn't. So, so the, book of, the book of Jonah tells the wonderful story of a, a prophet in the northern kingdom um, who is an idiot. Okay, God tells him to go to, uh, to Nineveh, and, which is the capital of the, the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians are bad. They're kind of like Nazis, only, you know, uh, they, don't, they don't drink schnapps or something. So, so... Uh, so God tells him, go to Nineveh and announce it'll be overthrown. Instead of going to Nineveh, he jumps in a boat and goes to Tarshish. That's like saying, Lawrence, go to England, and I get on a plane and go to Hawaii. You know, the opposite direction. And so, um, uh, and then so God goes, God, God uh, sends a storm. So the, the people in, in the boat realize the gods are mad at somebody here. Uh, and Jonah said, well, that would be me. <clears throat> if you chuck me over, uh, the storm will cease. So they said, oh, Jonah's God, don't get mad at us. We're chucking him overboard. It, uh, you want us to do this, right? They chuck him overboard. Fish swallows him up, which is they rescues him, spits him out on land. Jonah goes and pronounces, says to Nineveh, you'll be overthrown in 40 days. And Nineveh repents. And so they're not overthrown. And Jonah has a temper tantrum because he wanted, uh, well, just read you the rest of it. It's so wonderful. Um, so John, God does not destroy Nineveh. And Jonah chapter four, the great leaders pleased Jonah and he became angry. And he prayed to Yahweh and said, please Yahweh, was, wasn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in, abundant in loving kindness, when to relents concerning calamity. Now therefore, Yahweh, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And Yahweh said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. Then he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. Then comes a series of God appoints. And God appointed a plant, and it grew over to Jonah to be shade in his head to deliver him from his discomfort. So, mirac miraculous plant, shade, you know, like the 
I don't know, an hour and a half. <laughs> John was extremely happy with the plant and got appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it, and it withered. And when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching, scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better for me than life. So you get the idea that Jonah is being a petulant child. He's being an idiot. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Yahweh said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work which came up and did, you did not cause it to grow. It came up overnight and perished overnight. Should not I have compassion on Nineveh, the great city, which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. So the point is, this was probably written post-exilic in the southern kingdom. So they need a hero that's going to be an idiot, that's going to talk like this. And so Jonah is the, the perfect example. Jonah is mentioned in the narrative of First and Second Kings as a prophet who um, uh, prophesies expansion for the northern kingdom. Not good news for the southern kingdom, mm -hmm. you know? So, so he's kind of a, a fairly minor prophet who, you know, the, the, says stuff that's not particularly welcome to the southern kingdom. And so that's the guy that they choose, a, 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 a person, who, a fairly unsympathetic character to, make, to, make, to begin with. He goes to... He instantly disobeys God by going to Tarshish, and then he's a petulant child when God has mercy upon, upon, upon Nineveh. And the moral to this story is that God cares about the Gentiles. And there were a number of people in the southern kingdom who thought God is not talking about the Gentiles. First the Babylonians are killing us, then the Persians are killing us, then the Syrians are killing us. You know, God hates the Gentiles. God hates the Egyptians, God hates Nineveh. And so, so you have these, this red-hot hostility, but, but almost say oh, uh, uh, Jewish racism against the Gentiles. But you put those, se those sentiments into the mouth of somebody who's not from the, East, the Southern Kingdom, but from the Northern Kingdom, and unsympathetic. So you can, by condemning Jonah as an idiot, you're condemning yourself. Mm. That's the point of the book of Jonah. And the, the, with the question about the historicity, is that I would suggest, first of all, that never happened. Nineveh did fall. The book of Nahum talks about Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh falling. And is it likely that a Jewish prophet from the northern kingdom would go to Nineveh and they repent and it doesn't get written up in the same book that talked about Jonah? Or in the secular histories? Or in First Chronicles? First Chronicles was written post-exilic. Why didn't, that, that, this, is, this is extraordinary. This is like in the height of the Cold War, a, a Baptist fundamentalist preacher goes into the Kremlin and says, God's going to destroy you all, and all the Kremlin repents, gives their lives to Jesus, says the sinner's prayer, and, and, and throws Lenin out of his tomb. You know, that's the sort of stuff that you're talking about. That happens, and it doesn't get reported in, the history, in, in, first, in first and Second Kings or Chronicles, or the secular histories, or anywhere. Mm -hmm. that's, that's your hint. Never, never mind the, the, the big fish swallowing Jonah. That, that's not the problem. The, <laughs> the problem is the unlikelihood of something that spectacular happening and going unnoticed by the Gentile world and by the writers of the Bible that mention Jonah. So uh, there, there's, other, there's, other, there's other problems as well. As a matter of fact, Nineveh was not as big as they said it was. They said, you know, take two. You would say, um, exceedingly great city, three days walk to go across the city. No, but if they've excavated it, it, no city was that big. Maybe Alexandria, but not not in the back then. But the, but that ain't that ain't the point. The the the. It, but if you so that's where many even conservative scholars would say Jonah is not history. Jonah is a morality tale. And, but it's a morality tale that you need to know. If you're, in the, if you're in the southern kingdom, it is a rebuke to Jewish narrowness. It is a rebuke to post-exilic Jewish uh, mm. uh, Hebrew um, nationalism. You know, essentially Jewish racism. God doesn't care about the Gentiles. If God can care about Nineveh, then God cares about everybody. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of saying God, the, God cares that during, during the Second World War, God cares about those people in Berlin. I mean, this is kind of like, the, you know, how dare you say that? Yeah, but Nineveh was like that. Mm. Nineveh was the Berlin. So, 
uh, if God if God if God cares about Nineveh, that changes that changes everything. That's the point. And then to spend all your emotional energy getting upset about the historicity of you know, Daniel, you know, did it did it happen or not? Well, the message is so shattering. The message is so powerful. The message is so needed. That ain't the point. You know, you're not the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the real question isn't did it, it, did, did it happen? The real question is are we going to learn something about it so that it can happen now? Right. That's, the, that's the question. So, so I think that there was a, the, if you have a certain, the, the, the people who defend the historicity of the book of Jonah, like those that defend the historicity of, um, of Daniel, are well intentioned, but their, their presupposition that they brought to the text is, is if it's true, it has to be historically true. Mm-hmm. You, you can't have, Jonah has to be historically true because it says, you know, uh, uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying. Right. If you, for example, just the one last thing, if you, if you, most Protestants don't care about this, but Judith starts the same way. Judah starts in the twelfth year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled over the Assyrians in the great city of Nineveh. In the days of Arphaxad, who ruled over the Medes in Ecbatana. He is a king who built the walls of Ecbatana with hewn stones, and it goes on and on. I thought to myself, then it goes on. It, it tells you the story of after Israel came out of exile, it was living in peace in the land. Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Assyrians, came and invaded with his general Holofernes. So we got a problem. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar was never king of Assyria. It's in Babylon. But, but again, if you don't know the history, Babylon is Syria. Mm. Pagans. So, and, and, and this never happened. After, after Israel came back in the land, Babylon was no more. It was overthrown by Cyrus. The book of Daniel tells you that. Mm. So Cyrus came, conquered Babylon. Then the, the, the Persians were the big deal in town. So when Israel came back in the land. They were, in fact, a Persian province. Nebuchadnezzar, whether he's Babylon or, or from Nineveh, ain't invading anybody. He's gone. But you have all of these historical details that, that goes on for the first six verses to give you a sense of, of that's what it felt like to be there. They're building up uh, what some of us call very similitude, the, the sense of, to, to, to get you into the picture so that it has a greater emotional impact. Mm-hmm. So um, the, um, those who... Uh, defend tooth and nail the historicity of, of Jonah or, or, or Daniel, well, have no problem in, in saying Judith is a historical romance. But they say, but it's not in the Bible, so, so, but, so it, it's okay, so it doesn't matter. So th- there, there's less reason for the Orthodox. As far as I know, no, no Orthodox with two IQ points dropped together regards the book of Judith as a historical document. You know? so, but it's still, it, it's still in the canon. So if a historical romance like Judith can be the canon and still be the word of God and still have valuable lessons to teach us, like Judith is not about what Nebuchadnezzar did. Judith is not about what Holofernes did. Judith is about how a tiny, frail widow with no power can, can make all the difference in the world if only if she is courageous enough. That's what it's about. Mm-hmm. And that's true. That, that's, that's the message of Judith. That message is the word of God. That message is true. The, the lack of historicity in in Judith is irrelevant mm-hmm. to the message. Uh, in the same way as I would suggest the rebuke on the narrow nationalism in, from, from the book of <coughs> Jonah is irrelevant to the historicity of Jonah. You have to understand what, what it means. Anyway, that's my longer answer than perhaps you are not counting on. Okay, there you go. That's good. Maybe one more question before I let you go home and... Well, I'm relieved now because I thought Jonah was funny <laughs> when I read it. No, no, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, was, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. it was the... Um, and C.S. C. C. Lewis said that there's a certain amount of edifying Jewish humor. Mm-hmm. In, but again, if you if you bring with you to, to the reading of, of, of the Bible the understanding that there is no humor there, mm-hmm. then you you miss it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's all through the book of... Like the constant, what I what sometimes refer to as... Um, the praise band, mm-hmm. in in, in the, the the striking up of the band, uh, the, as, as a signal to worship the golden image in chapter in chapter three. I mean, they keep going, uh, repeating it over and over and over again. I mean, that's the humor. You know? mm-hmm. But if you if you're if you're focused in on 
defense of the historicity. Mm. Then you, 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 you dull yourself to what a wonderful book it is. I mean, it's a book of, so I, I would suggest that children can understand the book of joy better than the scholars can. Because the children approach it, they don't care about the historicity. For them, it's this wonderful story. It's this worship of this statue that's, that's so huge. You can't make a statue that huge. But I mean, it was taller than, <clears throat> I think, the Colossus of Rhodes. You know, and it's too narrow mm -hmm. for that. So people say, well, maybe it was on a pedestal. No, you're missing the point. A, a child gets the point. A child gets the point that yeah. this is a statue that's so tall, it's a monstrosity, mm -hmm. that it, it's unnatural. It, the, the statue itself is, is something that horrifies even before you do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Like a, a child gets it. But if you don't read it with the eyes of a child, if you don't read it with this sense of enchanted wonderment, mm -hmm. then you miss the, you, you, you miss all, not all the richness, but you miss a lot of the richness that's mm -hmm. actually in there. You know, there's, there's uh, angels in, in furnaces, there's God, you know, the lions, you got visions, you got, you know, um, uh, king uh, turning into an animal and then he, then he's grass, you know? I mean, the, the, these are the things that the kids, I mean, it's, it's almost like this, the Star Trek of the Maccabean period, that they, they, all, all these spectacular wonders. Like, you, you miss it if you're, if, if you're, if your approach to the book of Daniel in particular and scripture generally is one of um, defensive manning of the barricades, then I would, then I would suggest you, 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 miss the, you miss the enchantment that's in there that you're, that's, that's, meant to, that's meant to enchant you. I think that's my, my suggestion. Bless your heart. Thank you. Pray, 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 pray for the rest.